didn't get to choose my own walk-on song there. I don't think that would have been at. But um, I'm really excited to uh, follow up on what Sita had to say, and we'll talk about the, uh, the actual units of economics here that investors want to, to hear about. Uh, and with no further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Andy Aldrin to come up. Uh, Andy is a, a space educator along with myself, and he runs a fantastic program, a master's degree in space operations at Embry-Riddle University, and the rest of his resume is too long to go into. Uh, so in the interest of time, we'll leave it there. Uh, Hoyt Davidson, would you please join us? Hoyt Davidson uh, is with Near Earth uh, LLC, where he is a managing partner and founder. And again, I'll skip uh, the uh, amazing details. And Mike Meeling, uh, if you would please come up. Uh, Michael uh, is a general partner at Starbridge Venture Capital and has another one of those amazing resumes. But let's, uh, let's save our time talking to you. And we're going to try to uh, get some questions out of the way and then make this very interactive, since I know that we're the last panel here. Um, so I'm glad that uh, inflection points were uh, listed in the description of this panel. It's really important to me to realize that and think about the fact that it's not a continuous path to, to any financial destination. There are these moments and you have to seize them. This was brought home to me just a little while ago when I saw Elon tweeted, and I don't know if you guys saw this, Elon tweeted that Starlink is cash flow positive. Now if you believe him, which I, I hope is the case, <laughs> Uh, and that that covers, for instance, the launch cost of all that, that's pretty friggin' amazing. Any company that gets to cash flow positive that quick uh, is, is a success, and in a domain as challenging and exotic uh, as what Starlink is doing, uh, that's amazing. But SpaceX has done a great job of finding the inflection points they need to get to actually having a viable business that brings in some profits, but more importantly, creates that real economic credibility that brings in the investors along the way. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this inflection point idea. We'll just start with Andy. Sure. Um, great question. <laughs> We've actually been looking at the, the question of inflection points between where we are today and an, an economically self-sustaining uh, lunar presence. And surprise to surprises, there are lots of them. The idea is, is really making progress towards building a roadmap from here to where we want to be. And when we talk about roadmaps, we're talking about real maps, maps that have streets with intersections and traffic lights. The typical map that we deal with, the technology development map, is a straight line, and you do not need a roadmap for that. You need a gas gauge and a speedometer. But if we're going to get to the moon, there are going to be things that are going to happen in the future that really, really matter. And it's not just technology. A lot of it has to do with formation of markets. Um, markets that are going to drive um, the necessity for propellant mining. There's capability is, is one thing, but if we don't have someone who is going to spend billions, probably like $4 billion a year, buying propellant, then it's just it's not going to fly. There are things, there are inflections points that have to do with technology. Surprises, surprise. The obvious inflection point is, do we have low cost heavy lift? Right? If we do, it's a very different path. If we don't, it's going to be a lot tougher. Do we have propellant um, in LEO? Um, there are other inflection points that um, are a little bit stranger. Geopolitical things. So I'll probably get hate mail for this one, so I'm, I'm going to bring it up. <laughs> um, Bring it. <laughs> no, no problem. I'm used to it at this point. Um, U.S. or Western Chinese conflict over very, very scarce real estate on the moon. Right. We all know the vast ma majority of the moon is like the Mojave Desert, which you can buy for 35 cents a square meter. Actually, looked up. I could buy that. But then there are these little bits craters with permanent, permanently shaded regions on one side, permanently sunlit on the other side, that are like Hong Kong. Hong Kong real estate, real estate literally a parking garage in Hong Kong sold for $1 million a square meter. You add to that some of the complexities caused by the ejecta of regolith when you land on the moon, and you could easily see a situation where the first entity, we'll call it a country, to inhabit a crater would have a legitimate right to a safety zone that may encompass that entire crater for safety reasons. 
That has all the makings of a tremendous competition with China. What does it mean? If, if there is a competition for scarce real estate, that will drive up government budgets. It'll drive up the US government budget, it'll probably drive up the Chinese budget. Point is, there are, there are lots of these inflection points. We have a draft that we're working on that I think would probably dovetail really nicely with some of the work we've talked about here with LSIC to try and bring, um, it's not so much a temporal el element, but a sequential element of really what are the pathways, what are the roadmaps from here to a permanent settlement on the moon. All right, inflection points to uh, financing yeah, the lunar economy. Um, to follow on on Andy's comments, um, I think some of the inflection points are, you know, does the government uh, set as a all of government sort of policy uh, that there's a push to develop lunar space as a stepping stone for even longer, larger vision of you know human uh, migration or human settlement. Um, we really haven't done that yet, and it's not not meant to change NASA's mandate of a focus on exploration. It's just, again, kind of all of government, are, are we willing to uh, do this as a nation and, and state that? Um, other inflection points are we're now at the phase where we've created thousands of early stage commercial space companies and the venture capital community has been, uh, particularly in the last few years, uh, uh, incredibly generous in, in funding, you know, a uh, hundred of this and a hundred of that. Um, but we're now at the point where we need to start developing the really big expensive infrastructure, and that requir requires much larger pools of capital, the kind of pools usually from private equity funds or the public capital markets, or, or finding the right uh, government uh, financing mechanisms that, that work with our taxpayers and our citizens will support, and also you know, help in an efficient way uh, build more capital from the private sector. So that's another big inflection point. You know, do we figure that out? Do we figure out how the government can be a great customer without dominating the development of, of this infrastructure. Uh, so there's, as we say, it's, it's, it's a messy uh, map with a lot of uh, intersecting um, inflection points, uh, any one of which can change the course of, of how this ends up getting develop it, developed. Uh, some of it is competition, and it's not just China. Uh, I think a lot of the world has woken up to uh, the potential opportunities in space. Uh, I think India is going to be a huge uh, uh, player in this area, so so is Europe and Japan and a lot of other places. So we want that competition to build innovation and to kind of drive us into uh, figuring out the right way, right way to get through these inflection points. Um, the I've used over the years, especially when the idea of inflection points, um, looking at another industry that I saw go up from no one knowing what it was to a currently a $3.8 trillion annual economy, which is the internet. Um, you rarely ever know an inflection point until it's in your rear view mirror by years. Um, but there are some that, that, looking back on that, to echo a, a point that, that Hoyt just said, one of the inflection points for the internet was Vice President Candidate Al Gore talking about the information superhighway in almost every one of his stump speeches. And if you could imagine, would the internet exist the way it currently does if he had not been talking about it during that election? And so there are some inflection points that you see, but when you watched that as an inflection point, we really didn't know how seminal that was for the growth of what would become this, eco this economy for many years later. And so it's, it's hard to engineer inflection points but you see them in the rearview mirror. Sometimes you can. Um, for example, if you're trying to kickstart an economy, uh, a lot of times governments can come in and incentivize or subsidize certain things and they can kickstart things. In the case of the internet, the ARP ARPANET existed for 15, 20 years and the government was paying for it. So it was there ready to go when somebody decided to use it. So those two things can happen. But the number of cases where the same strategy of the government subsidizing something and it never goes anywhere. So again, you really don't know if your inflection point engineering works until you see it in the rear view mirror and you're now sitting on a $3.7 trillion economy. Thanks, you know, I do wanna say uh, the internet I think is a perfect example of US government getting the policy right. Not only did Vice President Gore uh, promote the idea that we transferred the, from ARPANET to the National Science Foundation and then opened it up, but Congress had the good sense 
to also pass a tax moratorium on internet e-commerce activity to allow the, uh, the internet to keep going and keeping the states from, from strangling it in, in complexity. Uh, those are the sort of things I think we need to see going forward. Now, I heard earlier that we need $3 trillion, I think, for this. Did, did you guys bring that? I know you have a fund, uh, Michael. In a zero interest rate environment, I could have yeah, brought you that, but not anymore. <laughs> uh, but no, seriously, um, I teach a case uh, often uh, on uh, Bill Gates's Terra Power project where you need to build a $4 billion uh, uh, nuclear power plant to, to save the planet. And guess what? You need to build like several thousand of them. And uh, the, the challenge when I work with my uh, master's students is it always comes down to you can't find the capital for that. that uh, that it's more than all of venture capital every year. And if we can't afford to save our own planet, basically, uh, how are we going to, uh, to develop the moon at the same time? So, um, actually, I have a pictorial representation of this that I will spare everyone. Um, Do we have a chalkboard? But you know what? Are <laughs> I, I would get in trouble for that, too. Um, but you know how a lion eats a water buffalo? One bite at a time, very strategically. I won't go into it, it gets really gross. Um, <laughs> But the point is, and getting back to the notion of roadmaps and, and destinations, um, we're going to have to do this one bite at a time. There is no investable proposition that says you, we need three, we need a trillion dollars. Give me a trillion dollars to go develop a pro propellant farm on the moon. The question is, is there a series of investable propositions that you can sort of start to walk down the road and make money on. So we're starting with clips, and that's, you know, it, it's a little bit of a struggle. We will not get through the early stages of this journey on private capital alone. We're going to need to cooperate with the government, and I think over time, we should see industry taking on more and more risk and government giving up more and more risk. But I think early on, the government's going to have to take a, a lot of risk to make this work. Yeah, to, uh Follow up on Michael's comment about sometimes you don't realize you've gone through an inflection point till years later. To me now, it's very clear that one of the most important inflection points that we have gone through was the COTS CRS program. Um, I, I was working with uh, one of the, the competitors for, for that uh, contract, um, and I had to go to a private equity firm and asking them for, to financially support this. And this was, this was a, a $50 million ask. Um, and I explained the COTS program to them, how the government was going to share in the uh, you know, NRV investment um, with no equity, no dilution. Uh, so it kind of made their return on capital higher. Um, and that they might, know how to, they might not know how to do diligence, this program, this technology, but NASA did. And NASA was going to put their money in over time when milestones were, were satisfied uh, that they knew were the important de-risking milestones. So, the private equity investor could sort of tag along on that due diligence support. Um, uh, but even that wasn't enough. What really made it happen was the CRS component because it wasn't a if we build it, they will come. It's a if we build it, they're already there. You know, you started, if, if you won this contract and got through to the last milestone, you had a long-term contract. You had, you know, your first market customer. Um, they wrote a letter two days later saying if, if this client got chosen, they would invest $50 million. Now, my client didn't get chosen for the technical aspects of the proposal, but the financing aspect passed with flying colors. Um, and that was because of the brilliance of the COT CRS model. The, the other brilliant thing that came out of it is it was a complete paradigm shift for NASA from funding one-off missions, that when a mission was done, the hardware was abandoned, to funding a new industry sector where you had competitors, in this case two, but you know, two's a big number in space, but at least it was a, a, a new industry sector where you had competition to drive innovation and to, to create a sustainable uh, business that would keep going forward. That has meant everything, and now it's been repeated several times, but the people, and some of them are in this audience that were a big part of creating the COT CS program, I think we all you know, owe them a huge round of applause. Michael, you want to add to that? I do. Of course you do. But Michael can go first. No, go ahead. Okay, so um, COTS is, was, um, it was and CRS is a great program, and we, we got 
risk sharing right. Industry was willing to accept, I mean, basically for industry, there's two kinds of risk. There's cost risk and revenue risk. Industry has been willing to accept cost risk, at least until Boeing just said they're never doing another fixed price contract. <laughs> um, but in general, and, and maybe sometimes irrationally so, but industry has been willing to accept that. It's been tougher to accept revenue risk. And what we did with COTS was we took revenue risk off the table. We guaranteed that. We're not really doing that with CLIPS. And so I wonder, and, and historically, we have not done public-private partnerships very well. And the EELV program is a great example. So the first part of the EELV program was um, we're going to darken the sky with satellites, so Boeing and Lockheed took on all of the revenue risk, all of the cost risk, and failed miserably. And it was bad. It was really ugly. Went to the government and said, this is not going to work. Government said, no, we need you. Well, then let's figure it out. And they restructured the contract. They restructured. The pendulum probably swung too far the other way. The government took on all of the risk because they needed the capability. What that did was drive up the cost. And in defense of um, my brother at ULA, John, or are you still, you're still here. Okay. Um, the government was driving the cost in. It wasn't, it wasn't ULA's choice to be high cost as the government wanted more and more emission assurance, but it did drive up cost, which opened the market for SpaceX. And now the pendulum where we are with EELV, with, with national security launch, is actually about where it should be, but it took us a long time to get there. So the lesson is public-private partnerships are hard. They need to be kind of dialed in, but the most important aspect of it is you must, at the end of the day, balance the risk because it's not going to be sustainable if somebody's in a lousy position. All right. Let me uh, throw another question out there, and I know that you, you've heard this one before because it's, it's one that uh, is, uh, is one of my talking points, but we talk about customers. We talk about investors a lot, equity investors. We don't talk enough about lenders, and lenders want collateralizable assets. And I'm convinced that I can go buy land in the Mojave Desert or a Hong Kong parking garage and somebody will loan me money because they know exactly what it is that they're lending against. They know that I own it. If somebody trespasses on it, we know who to call. And if there's going to be an argument, we understand under which jurisdiction we're going to adjudicate things. Uh, but with the OSTs, Kumbaya, sort of uh, a no sovereignty uh, situation, we don't have that. So. How do we get lenders uh, in to say that, you know what, I, I will loan you money against your, your lunar mine or processing plant or, or factory? That's, I, I that's think, you. I think for these cis-lunar um, companies, it's going to be hard to get much in a way of, of, of debt financing uh, for quite a while. I mean, the markets are just too uncertain, too immature. Um, I, I think the best we can hope is to structure uh, some interesting you know, uh, government uh, debt kind of solutions, um, and we can talk about that later. Uh, but you know, I'd, I'd love for there to be property rights. I don't think there's going to be property rights, so I'm, I'm going forward assuming that we're never going to have that. So you have to kind of fall back on things like, um, do you know, do you have this non-interference zone, and, and are you likely to have it forever if you create something of value and you keep operating it? Uh, can you use that as a kind of quasi-collateral? Um, the infrastructure that you actually do fund and create, you know, you're, you're going to own that, right? And, and then the resources you extract and process, um, we already have from the law of the sea that you can kind of own the fish that you take out even if you don't own the ocean. So, I you know, you, you have that. You might even have some long-term concessions from either your, your local government or the international community, you know, things like orbital slots or some, some virtual kind of concession or asset. So there's other things we can work with. Um, they're not nearly as good as actually having property rights, but you know, we'll, we'll work with what we have. Michael. Um, recently, uh, we have some of our portfolio companies have gotten advanced enough where they can actually look at debt. And what you're seeing these days is um, you don't have to have a concrete um, or little, literal piece of concrete in, in the case of a parking deck um, to be able to securitize that. Um, especially with debt. Uh, something that's come up over the past you know, five or six years is debt, uh, uh, debt financing based on your intellectual property. 
And you would think that oh, you would, a patent would be, more, would be the most valuable thing you would value in a company's IP stack, but it's not. It's trade secrets because patents expire. And but when you look at the the protections for something that's a trade secret, um, it's all based on the protections the company puts around someone discovering that trade secret. There's no property interest that you have in a trade secret. And so yes, when you look at the IP financing part of, of the debt markets, um, they're valuing the trade secret, which is the, has the least legal protections aspect, aspect of it over the value of the patent, which has the most legal protection for it. So sometimes our concept of it has to be a, a perfectible, you know, common law property interest, no. It depends on the value of the company and how difficult is it for someone to come and infringe on your property interest. And right now, getting to the moon is pretty darn hard. And so if someone is willing to infringe on your um, standoff zone on, on the moon, that's for a lot of debt owners, they're gonna look at uh, debt providers, they're gonna look at that and going, that's a pretty high bar. That's probably actually harder to do than someone actually figuring out a way to infringe on your common law property right. So just really quickly, I think it all comes down to, to balancing risk, and it's you've got three major, if you will, risk streams. You've got industry, and they've got we have our perception of risk. You've got government, which has a different way of looking at risk, and you got finance, which has a somewhat different way of looking at risk. And somehow or another, to make it all work, you've got to figure out a way of, of balancing this at each point at which you require a transaction. All right, I'm going to flip this now for a moment uh, and get the audience awake here. So I want each of you, I'm going to start with Michael, to ask the audience a question. I want you to poll them on something, show of hands, and then if you want to ask a follow-up question, you can, you can pick one member of the audience. Um, I'm going to do this for everyone. Uh, actually, ask two <laughs> questions. Um, actually, three real quick. Uh, okay. No, no, yeah. Wait, no, this, this will go, go, no, this, this go real quick. Um, for everyone that has actually does actually want to personally go in space, don't fool yourself, actually has really thought about this hard, that wants to go in space, raise your hand and keep it up. Okay? Um, if you have not, um, are you willing to actually go and stay and never come back? Keep it. <laughs> okay, that, I like that number. Okay, how many people have actually started to personally manage your finances and your life's decisions to be able to ensure that you have the financial wherewithal to do that? Three. Yeah. The only way I'm going is if somebody else pays. Me. <laughs> but, but that's fine. There are people in the room that are that. changing their behavior to be able to enable something, and that percentage point, there are a lot of businesses out there, well, that's the perfect um, market segment size they need because it's a motivated um, and interested and customer who has actually already taken action prior to the purchase. So that is a very useful number to see. Do you want to ask anybody in the audience a specific follow-up to that, or are you just good with your data? Well, my, mine is a similar put your money where your mouth is kind of question. Again, raise your hand and keep it up for these three. How, how many of you would, would tomorrow invest 10% of your investable net worth into the commercial space industry? Okay, and how many would put 25% of their investable net worth in the commercial space industry? Wow. All right, last one. How many would put 50% of their investable net worth in it? Okay. So that's pretty good. There are quite a bit at 25. Yeah, meet, meet, meet Hoyt and I out in the back hall. <laughs> I, I think the problem so, is there aren't great vehicles for you to do that yeah. uh, if you're not an accredited investor and willing to put right big checks. Uh, so I'm going to flip it the other way. I think, I think we, well, let me ask the question first and then I'll make my commentary. Show of hands, how many people spend less than 10% of their time working on or thinking about space? No one. That's a problem. Because we are not going to be successful in developing a cislunar colony, or, excuse me, economy by space cadets trying to sell to space cadets. We need to be, If we, a lot of us have talked about selling stuff on the ground. 
Is there anybody here from Merck? NASA is actually working with Merck, which is encouraging. And so my commentary is, as we think about things, particularly things like CLD, where we're talking about laboratories in space, manufacturing in space, we have got to get out of the bubble and start to understand you know, the forests, if you will, of pharmaceutical, the forests of the semiconductor industry. And, and when the VP of research and development from Merck or Pfizer says, you know what? I have a piece of research that I can only do on the space station. Then I think we're making real progress. And when 10 people in this audience put up their hands and say, you know, I, mean, I do pharma, I do pharma, but I'm just kind of interested in space. Then I think we're really making progress towards building a cislunar economy. Right. I want to do one of these too. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. You know, we've been talking about finance, a lot of talk about the NASA budget. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people who, uh, who work at NASA who aren't scientists, engineers, or astronauts. Would you, would you figure that, right? Uh, if I talk to the general public, they assume that's, that's all that goes, that goes on there. Uh, one of the reasons I, I'm running a program in, in space uh, business and policy is because, guess what, there's people who do that. So in the uh, office of the CFO at NASA, which I almost had the opportunity to run, Let's guess how many people are in there. If you think it's about 100 people, raise your hands managing that budget. Okay. If you think it's about 200 people, 200 people. Okay, 500 people. A thousand people. How many people? If you think there's a thousand people running that office? Okay. 1,500. One. No takers. 2,000. 2,500? Yeah. It's about there, all right? So most of you think it's bigger, I guess, or you, you were just in <laughs> okay. shock. And but there's about 2,500 people ma making sure that the $26 billion is, is being well spent. Is, is Rads here? <laughs> David Radzinowski, there you go. Okay, so he knows that. Good. I didn't see your hand. <laughs> and, you, and you called me the cause he of He actually did the job. All right, so I'd like to uh, just take uh, questions from the audience, if I could. Uh, who's got a good question for our panel? Back there. Sorry, we should always give the microphone runners some sort of heads up before we do this to them, right? Hi, Dennis Willey, uh, on my way out of the Army and hoping to continue to stay in the beyond Earth world of the future of space. Uh, came last year, very inspired by everything that Steve and, and Courtney put together, and look forward to this in the future. Um, I have struggled with my question all day, a little bit yesterday, and it has to do with what Bobby Law said yesterday about storytelling. And, and the reason I've struggled is because recently I've come across a couple of books that are novels, not corporate documents or policy <laughs> documents or anything like that, that have absolutely solved everything we're talking about for the next couple of years. And I say that loosely only because the mental models and the frameworks that we need to wrap our heads around are really well done in a couple of books that came out in the last few years. And so without naming the books, I wanted to ask the panel, what has inspired you in the world of pop culture or storytelling that gets you to, the way, to provide the remarks that you're providing today? Daniel Suarez is Delta V in, in um, Critical Mass. I, I actually talked to, to, the, to him um, at an economist event a few weeks ago, um, and yeah, he th and that's exactly why he wrote those books. Um, he, he did it with a mission, and so he's running around the, the industry trying to turn those books into reality. I was thinking the same thing, and I guess that is what you're referring to. Um, what, what amazed me to, was to learn that those books, which I would think would appeal mostly to people in this room, was a New York Times bestseller. And I think that shows the power of good writing and a good narrative, because it is really a technology and economic roadmap of how you do this. Um, but it's, it's wrapped in an interesting story, and we need to do a lot more than that. And you know, maybe Jeff Mamber's new graphic novel will be another <laughs> help, but uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. And I suggest to everyone who hasn't read those books to, to read them. Jeff's book is great, by the way. Is, he, is Jeff still here? No, he's left. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know what, nobody believes this, but I do not read sci-fi. I don't watch Star Wars. I love the original Star Trek. Um, 
So I'm probably not the person to answer. Plus, I had dinner with Daniel, and I said, you're nuts. Why are you sending people out to an asteroid? And he said, because we have to have the drama. And I came back and told that story to my wife, and she whacked me upside the head. My wife is an actor. And she <laughs> said, you got to be kidding me. You are such a curmudgeon. Um, <laughs> which is true. <laughs> But, I mean, honestly, the, the, the kind not to, I, I mean, we need enthusiasts, but there's no shortage of enthusiasm in the space community. There's no shortage of enthusiasm in this room. What I worry about sometimes is the shortage of reality. And so I'm an educator. That, that is kind of what I do. And so, um, yeah, it's a lousy answer to that question, but. <laughs> One, yeah. one quick, one quick no, no, one quick follow-up, which I, I think was interesting, and I don't know if I believe it or not, and I won't. I don't want to ruin the book for people, but there's basically this premise that if somehow you had twenty, thirty billion dollars and you did X with it, it would create this virtuous cycle that, that would then solve everything else, and I hope that's true, because that's basically one year of NASA's budget if you spent it, you know, in this certain way. Um, so I'd love I'd love for someone to uh, to figure out if, if if you know that is possible. Start out with twenty million. I'm going to actually throw out uh, yeah. a two more two more books. We'll Go ahead. Think. One uh, I don't know how many people and actually will remember this book, Kings of the High Frontier. No. Okay. One, two. Um, that's an old one. Um, the other is The Expanse, but not for the reason um, that most people would think. It's because um, from a E economic standpoint, the issue that I had with the expanse was if you want to go mine something, you're not going to spend send the most expensive, cantankerous, and ornery piece of machinery to go do it. Um, and this is where one of the things that motivates me is getting some economic reality into our conversations because I do see um, staffers on the Hill, I'm not going to name names, and other people in positions of de making decisions citing the expanse as expository academic research. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, that is not the way we're going to do it. Keep this mic away from me. Get close. Yeah, I don't think I put that in my <laughs> dissertation, but I'll <laughs> check it out. Yeah, so I just got to say, for me, it was the, the old classic Heinlein novels and uh, Andy's dad. Yeah. But, uh, those are the things that inspired me. The man right, I got I got space every single yeah. night at dinner <laughs> and every single day. I was out painting my deck one at one point. Dad called me up and he said, I want to talk about this cycler thing. I think I've got it worked out. <laughs> Dad, How I gotta paint the had, deck, man. I was called up about and the cycler. I literally I literally put the phone down and occasionally would walk by and go, Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I didn't suffer from a shortage of space. And <laughs> so, so does my wife. Say whether it's science fiction or not. <laughs> Let's get another question. So a good friend of mine says there's three things the government can do. It can, it can uh, give you a carrot, it can bring a stick, or it can give a sermon. Because that person is on the stage, he's forbidden from, seeing, from speaking to this issue, but what... Uh, What's given we live in the budget constrained environments we live in and, and some of the other realities and nobody likes big sticks. Um, what are the sermons that could be given by the government to enable off off planet uh, activities, whether it's on the moon or in space stations or whatever your, your pick your I, I leave it to you guys to pick what you want. I'm Michael from saying something. Yeah, you're excluded. OK, what? Right, you're, looking, you're looking at me like I'm going to give a sermon? Yeah. No, what sermon would you like someone to give in government or wherever else that would make a, an actual change? Yeah. I'll, I'll get myself in trouble here. Um, profit equals revenue minus cost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's some actual unit economics. There you go. It's not about the convection. <laughs> it's a hard one. I, I mean, the government has already said, you know, we have aspirations to, you know, go back to the moon, you know, first woman, next man, and use that as a stepping stone to Mars. So we've sort of told our populace that we plan to, to go to Mars. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I, I think it goes back to more policy than sermons. Um, 
in, in terms of having this all of government uh, buy-in to, you know, space is a huge potential market that we have to be a big part of. The, you know, the Space Force understands that for national security reasons, but for all other aspects of the government to realize that, you know, we're going to do agriculture and mining and uh, everything else in space. Um, I don't think we have that level of education and buy-in yet from the rest of government. Now, is that a sermon that some future president gives? I, I don't know. Maybe it's our job to, to do that sermon. Can I answer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, this goes back to the, to the Al Gore thing. You know, if he wasn't talking about the, the information superhighway, would the internet exist as it currently does? Um, so it, in, in my case, the, the one I do for space is I would love to see – um, a joint resolution of Congress where you actually have to have the president sign off on it saying that it is the goal of this country to have 20,000 American citizens living and working in space by the year 2040. Very simple. But that puts a marker. It puts Congress on notice and it puts the American people on notice that this is a national goal. We're going to do it. We can do it. Um, and business gets on board because there's leadership. I, I think, unfortunately, that president has to be both beloved and die in office for that to happen. But uh, uh, So I'll say one thing about this. It's not so much the sermon, which I just gave you. It's who would deliver it. Yes. And, and, and I'll just pick the sort of mogul that w would be appropriate. But Jamie Dimon, hmm? right? When Jamie Dimon stands up and says, you know what, I'm, we are going to put the next 10 hundred billion dollars into a space fund then I think we've arrived in some ways the proposition that we need to have a series of presidential pronouncements inspirational <clears throat> pronouncements and and focused government programs is unsustainable in the long term what is sustainable is creating a real cislunar economy I had the opportunity to give a sermon recently on my flight out here. Uh, uh, I ended up uh, I ended up seated next to, to a member of Congress, and so he was stuck with me for five hours. Uh, he, he was a sport. I, I won't say is who. He, is he still alive? He is. I won't say who it was. But, but you know, I said you know NASA budget. I was particularly on about the science budget, which uh, is unfortunately been been squeezed in a situation where everybody wanted to demonstrate they were parsimonious on the hill and, and decided to hold the NASA budget kind of still while letting Artemis grow. And so, who gets screwed? S and D gets screwed, and Alan Stern almost loses his his New Horizons mission there. But you know, he said, no, we can't do anything about that Medicare, right? And, you know, uh, just like property rights, I think we can get property rights, and I think we are going to have to finally face up to the fact that we can't let the entitlement programs destroy everything that is aspirational and decent in our society as much as we love them. Nobody wants to hear that, but, but I think that we can get there. And we're going to have to realize that if we're going to pay for those entitlement programs, we're going to have to grow our economy out of it. It's the only way uh, to solve that problem. And, and the way you do that is by investing in things that actually have an ROI for the population. And one of the few areas where we actually generate an ROI, as Michelle pointed out, is, is at NASA and, uh, and developing our space economy. So that's the sermon I want to give. Uh, and I want to give it to those, the people that make the, the decisions. Questions? Okay, so uh, I'm going to ask the panel then to give us a, a wrap-up statement, and we are going to uh, to finish on time and, and let you all out of here for happy hour. So we'll start with Michael down there. Um, I, I think that the you're going to see some changes, uh, whether or not we have a recession or not. Um, the the capital markets have contracted rather significantly, and there are a lot of marginally capable space companies out here. You know the names, you hear them all the time. Um, we're in entering a period where um, those companies are not gonna be able to survive. And we're gonna lose some good ones, we're gonna lose some bad ones, um, but that's gonna be a challenge, um, especially for where uh, national programs may depend on some of those companies. Um, there's, this is going to be cyclic. It will happen again in the future. Um, it happened in the internet, and how many people remember pets.com? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, the 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 dot com bubble pop. The this is now the time that for anyone looking to invest in this sector, both from a national organization, an individual, or anyone else, um, the entire technology sector in this country is on sale right now. 
Um, so if you're looking to invest, as Warren Buffett says, when everyone is selling, do the buying, and when everyone's buying, do the selling. Uh, now is the time to do the buying um, because your dollar goes a lot, long, lot longer way than it used to. I, I would agree with that. I, I think these thousands of uh, early stage commercial space companies that have been funded, um, most of them are not going to survive the next few years. We're already starting to see that shake out. Um, same with, you know, there's a dozen space backs that we follow. Um, you know, Virgin Orbit's already gone on. There's a few more of those that'll probably go under next year. Um, but, you know, good business plans, good teams uh, do find a way of attracting capital. Uh, so I think there is going to be a consolidation of this scarce capital among the best of the breeds of, of these various companies. And in reality, we don't need a thousand launch companies and a thousand Internet of Things companies and a thousand remote sensing companies. So we're going to go down to a more manageable um, number of competitors in each of these uh, segments. And it's going to be very painful. Um, but I think some of those survivors will be household names, you know, 10, 20 years from now. Um, but I think that puts even more pressure on getting the government side of this financial support uh, right. Um, and there's things we need to think about on the public-private partnership side, on you know, any, any debt support. Um, for instance, I was very pleased to see the Export-Import Bank can now give loans to companies providing services and not just doing manufacturing. That was a you know, huge positive step. We got to get tax policy right. Uh, there's a lot of bad ideas out there, but there's a lot of good ideas out there too. We need to figure out also ways the government can, with a reasonable amount of money in these constrained budgets, do things that are going to have 10, 100x uh, uh, factors in terms of um, uh, tech demo missions that they can fund, uh, maybe considering things like uh, space commodity reserves and uh, space commodities exchange, some things they can kind of kickstart and then let the uh, uh, private markets, public markets take over the funding of them. So there's a lot of work that we can do, um, but you know it is going to be tight for for a few years as we go through this cycle, this risk off kind of cycle we're in now. Oh my God, I'm counting on Andy to give us an uplifting note, <laughs> dude. <laughs> so I'm, in spite of my sympathies, I'm not going to jump on the Vulture Capital bandwagon yet, but I, I may watch it. And, salute it as it goes by. Now, what I want to say, what I want to stop with saying, and, and with all due respect to the distinguished rocket scientist from ULA who's now gone, I, I actually never said there isn't a market. In fact, um, I believe there could be. Moreover, I believe if it happens, it could do extraordinary things. I think that if we are able to develop a cislunar economy in which we get propellants, we get materials off of the moon. It could fundamentally change everything that we do. If there is a self-sustaining economic presence on the moon, it will enable NASA to go on to Mars because we'll take care of the moon for them with private industry. However, it is the most extraordinary, extraordinarily complex program you could imagine. I mean, the, the Panama Canal, somebody brought that up. That was a piece of cake, and it was tough. But the, the number of moving parts to this, geopolitically, economically, in terms of finance, if we are going to do this and really transition it to the private sector, is extraordinarily, extraordinarily complex. And we have to be smart enough to think about it. With all due respect to the internet, we will go down dirt roads. But I still think it's a good idea to at least have an idea of what the roadmap looks like today because it's going to be challenging. It's not going to happen as fast as we think. But at least if we know what the stopping points are, we can make some progress on this. Yeah, that is fantastic. Hey, um, Hoyt, I want to follow up on a point you made, Export Import Bank. Um, you know, uh, in the last administration, I talked to Kimberly Reed, who was running that, and I said, to her and the team, because they were actually their charter when they were renewed requires that 20% of the money they spend go to displace Chinese companies from uh, 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 operations abroad, right? The United States, I think through the Export Import Bank would be good a place to do it, should provide 
terminals for Starlink or Kuiper or any Western provider to every village in Sub-Saharan Africa, Oceania, and uh, uh, Asia and Latin America to make sure that the free internet ends up being the standard for, for the world as we transition to satellite. We don't, because the Chinese, I guarantee you, are going to do that belt and road internet and give the farmers in Bolivia, uh, you know, the connection that doesn't let you look up Tiananmen Square. So I think that that would be a great thing if anybody knows who's running the Export Import Bank now, uh, get that message out to them. Uh, but with that said, thank you, panelists. Thank you, uh, uh, Steve. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, the beyond our team, I, I've been uh, been proud to, to be uh, kind of part of the team and an advisor since since the beginning, and it has been amazing to see what you've achieved and what's come together here and, and everybody that's in this room. So thank you. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Yeah, Wait, Michael, you don't run off. You got to. Thanks, panel. This is. Okay.